Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. So we do 20 minutes of shop talk, tech talk, and 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys. So please write in. We are so, well, first of all, I'm Liz Hinline. I am a director and creative director at New York Film Academy. And I'm so pleased and excited that we have an amazing production sound mixer, David Brownlow, who just jumped in and here he is because he's early to set like a good <laughs> crew person. Hello, David. Hi, how are you? I'm great. So yeah. tell me, is this the truth that if you want to find out what's really going on in production, you ask the sound person? Uh, well, uh, if you really want to know what's happening on the set, you might add the, the sound person, you know, um, but you know, those makeup ladies in the makeup trailer, they really get the scoop on what's happening with the actors. Uh, so, um, you know, we all have our own insights into the production. A hundred percent. And and plus you have, but you have your ears everywhere. And that's what I think it's really funny that people don't realize that sounds always listening. Well, I, I kind of have to be because, you know, half of the job or a big part of the job is noise suppression. Mm. So, you know, film sets can get very noisy. So, um, you know, on the uh, remember the first day of Cowboys and Aliens, you know, in the town where we get all ready to go and we say, OK, you know, uh, you know, roll sound and we're li listening and you, we're hearing this whine. And I had to take off running throughout the town to try and figure out what it was and the special effects guys had hidden their generator in a back part of the town and they had it running without telling anybody so you know first day first shot you know i had to run in and uh find out what the problem was so what is your what drew you to production sound because i mean it is a great job and the thing is to if you know for people who are from other departments i come from uh, the directing and the cinematography department. We all, if you are a sound person, we're like, you will always work because mm -hmm. there's always a need for great sound. But what drew you into the, into that part of the, of the field? Uh, well, it was a little bit by default. Uh, I had, there was a small film school here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, if you can believe it, called the Anthropology Film Center. And the fellow who ran the school had been a sound man in New York. In fact, he in tape recorders, you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape tape recorders. Mm -hmm. And you know, we I took this film program from him that lasted five months, and I learned a lot about sound. So when I left New Mexico and went to L.A. and went to uh, I. Uh, I wasn't going to the AFI, but I heard that was a place to go to meet people to work on films. And I went, when I went to the AFI to work on, I worked on a bunch of films there. Everybody wanted to be the DP or the director and no one wanted to do sound. So, you know, I happened to know a lot about sound. So I said, well, I'll, I'll do the sound for these, for these various different mm -hmm. movies. And so that's how I got into it. Um, Along the way, I did a lot of other work in other departments, but I always kept coming back to sound because, like you said, you know, it seemed, you know, it was sort of the path of least resistance. There was a big demand for people doing sound. And by the way, that's sort of what, uh, you know, later on, if I may, uh, as the industry changed in the 80s because of cable television and video cassettes, um, eventually non-union production began to rival union production in mm. Hollywood. And the unions quickly realized that there was one guy on the set that if they could get, you know, if he left, there was no film. Right. And that was the sound guy. Mm. So that's when uh, Mark Ulano organized us all into the union and how we all got into the union in the mid eighties. Anyway. Um, and but did you come up through like, I mean, you you just jumped right in. You didn't. Is is there a path that people come up through? Like, do they start as a PA and then a boom? And how does that work? Yeah, yes. Like, uh, in, in fact, the film I was just on, SpongeBob. You know, uh, I um, 
I needed crew and I, I have an email list of all the sound people here in New Mexico and I put out an email and said, hey, does anybody know somebody who wants to work in sound? And I got this email back from this woman, Catherine Lee, very good. She had worked in other departments. She said she was interested. I brought her onto the film. It was an easy film. It was not technically challenging. Mm -hmm. And I was able to train her and show her the ropes. And in a couple of days, she picked up most of what she needed to know. And along the way, she got into it. And I think she's going to be very good. And there was a guy in the office uh, who, you know, this guy Galen, who was a, came from music world, who said he was interested in sound too. So, you know, here in New Mexico, that's how I'm picking people up. So. And were you mentored at all? Uh, a little bit. Uh, in uh, When we were doing Koyana Skatsi, um, I uh, maybe people out there will know he's one of the most, uh, he, I think he has, next to John Williams, the composer, Randy Tom has more Academy Award nominations and Academy Awards than anybody else. He's a post sound mixer at Skywalker Sound. And uh, we, when I was working on Koyana Skatsi, we decided we wanted to do all these stereo sound effects. And mm -hmm. we actually hired Randy Tom to come down to LA. And he and I went around LA for a couple of days doing stereo sound recording and stereo sound effects recording. So yes, you know, I learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to know, because I think one of the unsung heroes, and we talked about this the other day, is the boom operator. Yes. And and what just what are some tricks like that 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 if you were doing boom that you wouldn't want to know? Is there any like because it seems you know suspectedly easy, but it really is so not. Absolutely. Uh, you know, on and many times, you know, people come and visit on the set and they all think, hey, I would like to do that job. It looks really easy. You just have to stand there and hold the microphone. But it's kind of not like that at all. Uh, the, you know, the boom person has to be on the set all the time and sort of really focused on what's happening with every department. You know, the, the lighting department, the grip department, uh, the camera department, what's the camera photographing? Again, you know, what uh, noise suppression is always a big deal. You know, are windows rattling or, you know, and he's also uh, does, uh, uh, puts microphones on people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, has to know how to, uh, you know, conceal and make uh, wireless microphones work and sound good. And, you know, he also, you know, he is the person that's closest, generally speaking, to the action. I mean, you know, he's standing out there and everybody else is sort of faded in the background and you sort of have the camera and then you have the boom man. So, the, you know, politically, the boom man has to be very smart too. He has to be a real diplomat, has to know how to get along with everybody else on the set. Uh, whereas other departments can sort of hide away in their departments, mm -hmm. the boom man is, is really very essential and really good boom men are, are a, a huge presence on the set. And so do you have like a core team? Like, so if, you, if you're like hired on a job, you have your, your core people that you, your go-tos? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, it, as it has evolved over time, right? Because some people move up and they become mixers themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily go from job to job. I'm kind of not that. So um, they, they might be working somewhere else. So like I have like a pool of people. Right. Like I said, I have this email list of all the sound people here in New Mexico. And whenever I start a project, I immediately send out an email and say, hey, who's out there? You know, who wants to work? Uh, who's available? And uh, I try and find the best person I can find. Has yours, is there a, as a production sound mixer, which is, which is, which is an artistic uh, position, has your um, style changed? over the years, is, or is there a style? Uh, well, 
not my style has the big change that's happened uh, is the fact that now with multi-track recording and with really high quality wireless microphones you basically put everybody who's going to be on screen gets their own wireless microphone mm. so not only do you record with the boom but you also can record each actor separately on their own track so that you have the option if something happens to go to that track, that isolated track for just their dialogue. Um, and that's the, the biggest change. But the, the main thing I think that we're trying to do as sound mixers is capture the original performance of the mm -hmm. actor. That's the most important thing. That, that's what the audience wants. They want to hear that original performance in the original space. And I think that's what every mixer really strives for. And is it still, I mean, are, are we allowed to, as filmmakers, have overlapping, with, with everybody having their own track, are we allowed to have overlapping dialogue? Absolutely. Like conversation? Yeah, I just overlapped you. So, <laughs> of, of course, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know what's, what, what's going on with the actors, that's, that's what you want. You know, you want them to, to go with, with, uh, with what, they're, what they feel comfortable with comfortable with for their performance you know that's what you're looking for and yes that's changed now uh you know also uh by the way you know i uh on lone survivor we had the four um uh, soldiers the four navy seals who had wires on but i always had two booms up too so my boom man had a boom up and my utility guy had a boom up too so we're always you know trying to capture a, as much of the sound overall as we can and um you know of course people can overlap and you know uh in during the battle scenes i mean you know people are screaming and there's gunfire going off and there's a lot happening all at once mm -hmm. so yes you just kind of capture it all and and uh yeah over you know the whole overlapping thing is kind of a holdover from um when people used to shoot in the you know the two close-ups now that we're shooting everything simultaneously with multiple cameras overlaps don't of are kind of a thing of the past that's so interesting so like as we're talking you know i'm really enamored with the show waco that you did right. and there so you would have main actors but then you have a helicopter landing and your things come in how it so that's still you can still even with large gunfire sounds that are happening around uh, still get the clear sound from the dialogue yes you can uh, and um, you know it's very challenging uh but it's very exciting too i mean you know you can again with the multi-track uh capability of digital you know and you could you know you put out as many microphones as you can and just capture as much of it as you can. I was very fortunate on Waco, by the way, that the post mixer who also got nominated for an Emmy, we all got nominated for Emmys for that show, was Bo Borders, who also had mixed Lone Survivor. Mm. So, you know, he was, you know, really into, you know, this sort of sound stew of things going on. So when you're on set, like, like, how does that work? So you have maybe 10 channels going like how do you how are you monitoring everything or you know or how do you know that something's either not right or could be better well i'm i'm trying to create a single mix track a, a single mix mm -hmm. down of of the multi tracks that i'm recording so you know when you're putting uh, so you know i'm primarily writing the boom and listening to the boom that's always my primary sound and you know if people if an actor is turning and walking away from the boom i might bring in their wireless mic to capture their you know what the boom can't hear or that sort of thing so i'm doing a live mix as we're going but um again because of the multi-track if something happens the the post sound mixers can always go back to that isolated track if they need mm -hmm. to pull something out and bring that into the final mix and do you have conversations with those post sound mixers pre shooting? No. Is there like a design? Like, would that be helpful? Like, would like we're going to design how you're going to design the project? Well, you know, you know, um, uh, um, 
I wish we'd do more of that. You know, I was uh, uh, the sound mixer on, um, I was talking to the sound mixer on um, a, a, a British sound mixer who, uh, you know, he talked about this film that he did where he had six weeks of prep of just sound. So, you know, in, in America, in the United States, we don't always fighting budget constraints. And unless you have a director who's really tuned into sound and says, hey, I want to bring a mixer on early for some to work out specific problems, it's usually taken for granted that you bring the sound on it. The, I'm the, like the last hire, hmm. the last person to come on. And, uh, you know, they're just uh, hoping that, you know, I can get tuned in enough to, to do my job. But yes, um, you know, uh, Chris, you know, uh, uh, look at um, uh, uh, something like Les Mis, you mm -hmm. know, huge film like that that was all recorded live. Simon Hayes, you know, had weeks of prep. You know, he uh, got the wardrobe to department to sew little cotton pouches on the people's okay. co uh, costumes to hold the mics. And they did rehearsals. He got to work everything out before the show started. So in certain situations, you know, on bigger shows, people do have that luxury of, of lots of prep. But generally speaking, in the United States, that doesn't happen very often. So as a, so is your because being on location let's say with a waco show or, or you know lone star a big sort of action thing is that your th like when you read a script you're like i want to go for like the big bombastic showy productions or bless the studio comfort like do you are there choices that you're making lifestyle wise or script wise when you're looking you know when someone offers you a position uh to a certain extent, yes. I mean, there are certain things that I'm just not interested in working on, and I have the luxury of of not having to do them. But obviously, the the bigger, more action shows, the harder they are out in the desert, up in the mountains, is much more <laughs> uh, fun and challenging. And you know, in Lone, Lone Survivor, we did a scene with the four characters at thirteen thousand feet on oh, wow. the edge of a cliff. You know that was like incredibly cool very challenging to do com compared to the spongebob movie <laughs> which i just completed which was all on stage you know and uh you know uh, uh much you know you have uh, a special effects movie like that's going to integrate am animation you know you have to film the same thing three times Mm -hmm. You film it with the character in the live character in the scene you film it with the little figurines of the animated characters and then you film it with nothing so mm -hmm. there's you you know um, yeah i was actually on that show i mic'd the director a lot because she was you know reading the script right. and describing what the scene was was the animated part of the scene that we were filming live so yeah it's you know sitting in a pretty boring <laughs> but so um and so in in our questions this goes to it mark asked what makes a film an easy film well what makes a film an easy or a hard film is it because you have to move the cart up the side of the mountain or um, um what are those considerations uh i i don't know well obviously there's uh something that's physically challenge challenging might be uh, you know there's not a necessarily a hard film in terms of recording the film there might mm -hmm. be a harder film in terms of the location challenges that you are faced with as opposed to again doing something all on a studio um, like independence day or something that you're all mm -hmm. on studio and stuff and you know you're you're in the air conditioning and you know you're snacking away all day and you have a nice cup of coffee in the morning and you know that kind of thing that makes makes it a little easier but again the challenging stuff is just is it's just better it's just uh um it, you know you 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 know you feel like at the end of the day you've really accomplished something mm. you know um so and how how is your relationship with the cinematographer and how do you how do you sort of team up with that 
Uh, well, that's a great question. You know, the the uh, better the cinematographer, the easier the relationship. You know, uh, on um, on Seraphin Falls, which was this western I did, uh, uh, I was actually the boom man on it. it. Was shot by John Tull, who's got a couple of Academy Awards. You know, The Last Samurai and these other things. And he's like a complete filmmaker. Mm. You know, we, we would do these big outdoor scenes. And, you know, he I, one day he walked past me and he looked at me and he said, hey, you're going to need a ladder for this shot. You know, he was th not only was he photographing the movie and thinking about that, but he was also thinking about the sound and he was thinking about helping us out as well. So there are, you know, there are a lot of filmmakers who, you know, the, the uh, you, uh, who is it you, inter the DP you interviewed, Richardson? Uh, uh, right. Bob, Bob, yeah. Bob mm -hmm. Richardson, yeah. You, you know, he, you know, he's like a complete filmmaker. He's mm -hmm. concerned with the whole film. He's, you know, he, and, and he's done enough films that he can do that. So, you know, he's, he, he's watching the whole thing and he, you know, and uh, cinematographers know that, it, you know, they want good sound. They know that that's going to help their picture. Right. You know, they they want everybody to, to participate and uh, and and make a better film. Right. So going out of the way to either make room for you or make sure your boom person's in there or has the apple box they need to get up, you know. It seems like that would be oh, where no, I think we had a little dropout. Go again. I'm, I'm done. You were, uh, you were talking <laughs> I'm about just it. saying that that it seems like that's where the collaboration could come in, where everybody's sort of aware of what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And and good DPs know that, you know, I mean, they're they're again, they're they're not just DPs, they're filmmakers. You know, you want as many filmmakers on your film as as you can get, you know, people who are, you know, conceiving of the whole thing and and understanding the big picture. That way they can do that fit in their part even better. Um, fantastic. So we have a bunch of questions here, so I'm going to just jump in. Um, so Joe asks, I'm a music producer and engineer. What are some of the differences and similarities between mixing a song album and mixing for film TV? Wow, uh, um, that's a good question. Um, I again, uh, it gets back to you know multi-tracking and uh, you know uh, um, having many options, having many microphone options. You know, finding the the right micro. You know, you're, we're in many different rooms. So, you know, one microphone might sound better in one room than another microphone. So having a, you know, a selection of microphones to go to, um, you know, uh, having, you know, uh, understanding maybe you can plant microphones in a room or under, you know, I have a variety of different lavaliers that I can use. You know, one lavalier might sound better on somebody than another one. Things, things like that. So microphone selection is really a big similarity to music production. Um, well, also, you're in a film production, you're, you're sort of getting a one shot chance. You're doing that scene that day. Right. And that's it. Yep. And, and there you go with that. Yeah, well, uh, you know, generally you have multiple takes, too. True. Although, you know, more and more, uh, um, you know, you don't get a rehearsal, you know, like the first take is generally the rehearsal. So you, you know, you can end up scrambling and, you know, not creating what you thought you were going to create on that first take. So it helps to have multiple takes because then you can, you know, um, you know, keep making your mix, improving your mix and making it sound better and blending, you know, your mics together and stuff like that, the more takes that you have. You know, on Lone Survivor, it was very cool that, um, you know, Peter and so kind of go, th you know, with the cameras, the cameramen would figure out where to go. So they, you know, and the special effects guys would figure out where the bullet hits were and stuff like that. And I'd have a chance to listen to everybody's microphones. And then, uh, you know, like 10 o'clock in the morning, 
Berg would like turn the cameras on and we would shoot for a couple of hours and just like go crazy and just let everybody go. And uh, it was very exciting. You know, it was very, you know, you know, there was no like stopping, you know, cut. Hey, you know, it was like, no, 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 move, you know, move that camera over there. Keep just keep going. And just so, mm -hmm. you know, you create the, you know, the kind of the chaos of battle right there in the moment. And that was like very, very cool and very fun. So and you know you had a lot of chances to capture all kinds of things, sound wise and picture wise and acting wise. So. So on your cart, you're getting the feeds from all the different cameras as you're doing the mix. Yes, uh, I can see. Yeah, absolutely essential to uh, to to see what the cameras are seeing. Because yes. you're probably not getting any sight lines to to. Um, sometimes uh, no i i generally like to set up where i can see uh, where you can see what's happening yes absolutely mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, and to have that kind of connection uh, you know uh i yeah i, I and um you, that comes from just where you know i i i doing so many films i i just need to be connected you know i'm just got that antenna up the whole time to try and you know like we were started off talking about you know do i know what's happening on the set or what's happening on the picture mm -hmm. so i'm always trying to listen in and trying to catch something a director might be telling an actor to do you know particularly if there is a performance thing that's going to go off where the, an actor is going to start off very quiet and then end up screaming mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of things that i need to know about you know or be tuned into so that i, I can compensate for that so when you start a show can you tell from the beginning this is going to be a good experience or this is going to be a rocky experience uh a little bit um you know i i i you know i've been very fortunate i'm pretty happy with most of the films that i've done you know i've really enjoyed most of the people i've been with um there's always kind of a curveball that comes in there, you know, on uh, on uh, um, on Waco, uh, you know, the first time he didn't like it at all. You know, he was um, uh, so it took a while to kind of gain his trust. Um, you know, I, um, uh, I've I've had that kind of thing happen quite a bit with an actor. You know, actors are uh, have a lot of stage fright. Mm. You know, there's very few really confident actors out there. It's interesting. Um, yep, they're all kind of like figuring out what they're doing too. You know, they're mm -hmm. uh, you know how they're going to create this character, and uh, you know they're they're going through their process too. And so they've gone into the makeup trailer and they've had their makeup and their costume on and stuff. And they're, they're very comfortable with that. And then when they arrive on the set and you have to get in their face and put their microphones on, you know, you're just, you're just another thing that they're having to deal with. So being able to do that without mm -hmm. interrupt, without, you know, as stealthily as you can, without distracting them or, uh, or putting them sort of in the process of filmmaking you don't want right. to take them out of their process right right so so that's a very that's the most delicate thing you know generally now though we're wiring people before they get to the set which is a, and on lone survivor you know they were wearing all this gear right and it was very convenient because they had these pouches so you just put the mic the radio mic in the pouch and put the mic in a <laughs> You know, you're ready, you know, everybody's ready to go. And so, you know, things like that. Um, Paul has a cool question. How do you keep with tech, keep up with technology changes? What is the future of tech in the sound industry, do you think? Uh, well, there are, there are lots of user groups and the primary user group that most of the sound men I knew know hang out on is called JW Sound, Jeff Wexler. Jeff Wexler is one of the most well-known sound mixers in the business, and he maintains a user group and everybody hangs out there. And if you have a question, you can go to the group and ask the question and you'll get 20 
answers from the manufacturers, from the people who've already had that experience and stuff. And, you know, it, it, there's a real collective, you know, we all know that this equipment is, is pretty complicated and very sensitive and, you know, little things, there can be glitches along the way and people, so there, you have a place where you can go and get answers and get the right answers. Uh, the main thing that's happening with the technology is the miniaturization of the transmitters. You know, Sure has come into the business with this tiny little plastic transmitter that, you know, is, you know, you, the person can hardly know that it's even there. And um, so, uh, you know, the quality of the, of the wire, of the lavalier mics uh, has improved dramatically. Yeah. So that now they sound, you know, incredibly good. So um, that's really the future, you know, is maybe uh, uh, these very, very high quality wireless mics. Also, these little, these little transmitters now can also record sound. Mm -hmm. So you, um, so, uh, you know, you can put a transmitter on somebody and it's recording all the time. So no matter what happens, if you have any kind of RF interference or if they get out of range or they take off in a car, you know, you can always bring this transmitter back and pull out the little card and you have the recording of what oh, interesting. Yeah. And but, but how is the sound with that recording? F perfect. Really? Yeah, it's very high. It's a high quality as, you know, as you can, it's amazing. The miniaturization uh, and uh, is phenomenal, you know, uh, it's great. That is cool. Peter asks, what is the most useful thing a director, a director can do to help you prepare? Give me a rehearsal. <laughs> let, let me hear, let me hear the actors speak and, and, you know, um, um, uh, let me know what they're doing. Just, you know, uh, that, that's the most helpful thing they can do, I think. Um, and do you, um, it's so funny when you go on sets, it's usually like the, the sound people hang out with the sound people, the grips hang out with the grips. Do you, are you the one that the, sort of tries to befriend everyone or do, or do you sort of, are you sort of more in, in well, your- uh, Well, I, 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 we, we work with the wardrobe people very closely. Mm -hmm. You know, generally you, and not me, usually my utility person who's wiring the people has a very close relationship with a wardrobe person. They may be putting their packs and their mics on again before they come to the set. You know, uh, you know, I have I know all the grips because if you're working outside and they're putting up these big uh, uh, reflective uh, tarps and things like that, and they're rattling, you know, or flapping, or with the electricians doing the lighting, if they're putting up gels and those are making noise and you know, with the electric departments, like how far away can we get the generator, you know, and uh, so, uh, and with the camera assistants, you know, you're working with the camera assistants, they're, they're helping you out, you know, what's the shot, what's the framing, um, things like that. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, you end up working with everybody and uh, it'd be, you know, it's a collab, it, it's a total collaboration with everybody, so. So do you, do you consider yourself like a, a techie who loves storytelling or a storyteller that loves tech? Well, I love the story. You know, I, I want to know, you know, what we're filming, you know, and uh, what and I, I, I really enjoy the fact that, you know, uh, uh, next to the director and maybe the script supervisor, I'm the one and my crew are the people who are most involved in the actual mm -hmm. performances that are happening in front of the camera. You know, that's a very uh, exclusive role to have. You know, I get to, to hear you know, and watch and see what, what the actors are actually doing, you know, and uh, that's, that's very exciting. You know, there, I've worked with directors in the past who've come up to me after a long scene and say, hey, David, how was that? You know, did, did, you know, Lassa Hellstrom, you know, he's, he, you know, I, did we get that, you know, did that, and I'm like, yes, you know, yes, that was amazing, or, you know, nah, that wasn't, you know, uh, you know, that could have been better or something like that, you know, because I'm the one who's there doing that, right, involved on that, on that kind of level, so.
you can have those kind of relationships on films on television you know maybe not so much because you know the actors are doing doing their parts over and over and over again so is are there any types of projects either and we we didn't even get into documentary and, and that and the ex, the excitement of that which is a whole other right thing um is there something that you want to gravitate towards now like would you rather do jobs closer to home would you rather go on a documentary like what 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 are you feeling these days no i'm trying to work at ho at home I, I i sort of gave up traveling out of state uh you know i've been asked to come to la i've been asked to go to i i, I a few years ago you know i went to uh to boston to work with seth mcfarland on ted and that was a lot of fun but generally i you know it would i i you know i traveled for a long time mm -hmm. um, and um i do do documentaries and there are you know i'm always blown away by how many interesting documentaries there are to make here in new mexico and uh so i i really enjoy that kind of work you know it's uh um as, as probably you know of the 13 films they're making here in New Mexico right now, I can't think of one of them that I would really want to work on. <laughs> That's funny. So, but, with the arrogant, but uh, you know, uh, um, uh, anyway, you know, there's with the documentary though, that's that's a different skill set because there is no let's do a rehearsal. There is more. So that must be really feed into your storytelling passion because you really have to be present and. Yeah. And you get, ex cool. again, but you get that exclusive entree. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just, we did this filming for uh, this Canadian company is doing a, a story about Tim Downey, who's the head, head writer for Saturday Night Live. So they came out to New Mexico to film Will Short, Will Forte, who's here making the TV series MacGruber, and Bob Odenkirk, who's here doing the new season of Saul. And so we interviewed both Will Forte and Bob Odenkirk. And, you know, this was just a few weeks before he had his heart attack. Mm. So that, and, uh, you know, he's like incredibly cool. You know, he, he wrote that famous Chris Farley uh, uh, scene uh, uh, where he plays the Chippendale dancer. Really? Yeah, he wrote that scene. You know, I had no idea. I, I had no idea that he was a Saturday Night Live writer. Mm -hmm. And so you you know you got to he hear these guys talking about the writers on Saturday Night Live. You know that was like very it was really cool. You know, and spend time with them. And so yeah, documentaries are you know can be. Uh, uh, more interesting than a feature film for the insight that they give you into something that you may not have known anything about and um and just for the layman like if you wanted to if people wanted to get good quality microphones how do they judge what they should get uh i, I would recommend they go onto one of these uh, go into jw sound and onto the message board there are a lot of beginners on that message board, you know, people mm -hmm. who sign up, who ask those kind of questions, mm -hmm. you know, people are, you know, what, you know, what, what, how, you know, what's a good package, you know, audio equipment package to get where there are a lot of beginners on there, you know, and they ask those kind of questions and, uh, you know, they get lots of different answers. There's many different ways to go. There are more and more really affordable uh, microphones and recorders out there that you can get in very cheaply now, you know, uh, and, you know, they're very high quality recorders and you can do a lot, you have a tremendous amount of capability. And for someone coming up, what's your suggestion if they wanted to break into sound? What are you telling your, your people? Well, you can start as a utility, you know, and plus, if you want to come to New Mexico, there's plenty of work. You know, there's a, a, a ton of work here. I, I uh, you know, and um, uh, you start, you know, by getting to know people, you know, you could start on the set as a PA, you can work in other departments, you know, a grip department, electrical department, whatever, 
uh, and, and get to know your way around a film set and stuff. And maybe during the film, you get to go over and you meet the mixer and you meet the sound crew and you say, hey, this is something. In fact, a guy just did that on SpongeBob, you know, this guy from The Office. And I tell you, if I get a chance, you know, I would definitely give, give that guy a shot. I would bring him onto a crew as a utility and, and, and let him know, uh, uh, you know, as much as I could, bring him up. I'm definitely into that. And, he, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here in New Mexico. Uh, the union local here sends out a job blast every week, and there's always positions available in sound, you know, so. That's great. That's yeah. great. Thank you. So is there, do you, do you do social media? Is there a place that people can follow you or? Uh, no, I, I have a Facebook page, you know, that that's pretty much it. You know, I post on there. <laughs> okay. And, and that's just your name, David? Yes. David Brownlow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Cause I'm sure people want to reach out and just say hi or something like sure. that. Uh-huh. And um, we have sadly come to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. you, okay. <laughs> and you have been awesome and so giving of your, you know, thoughts and your background and your creativity. And it's been really a joy to have you on the show. Got something out of this. Yeah, we got a lot out of it. And thank you, New York Film Academy, for presenting the 2020 series. And everyone have a great holiday weekend. And we will see you guys later. Thank you so much. Bye.